from molecular biology, so from the royal palaces to the coal mines, you know, it just goes straight to a clinical case. And I think what I mean by that is that we are all together in this um, a patient, and obviously we'll do it all together here and over there. So we'll have some, uh, Simon, Mentimeter, which I don't know how, how to uh, ask people to uh, join. Fantastic. So there will be a clinical case. I'll tell you, it won't be difficult because the diagnosis it will be there on slide two. <laughs> so it won't be a problem. The problem is how do we go from this initial presentation and see whether we can achieve some uh, agreement? Uh, also because at the end of the t uh, at the end of the day, I'll be I'll be presenting some the new forthcoming sort of new ARDS guidelines, which then we'll see how much what we said today may or may not match with what um, it will be published. Uh, so let's see. So, <clears throat> so this is basically the average patient in, in terms of age that we have seen over the last how many years. Uh, but the added complication has got a BMI of 40, but it's non-smoker, fit and well, drinks a little bit, nothing else, and just came to, comes to uh, the ED department with the symptoms that you see. Now, on examination is what you find there. So it's a bit dysnic, respiratory rate is high. You can see it's quite low saturation despite being a non-rebreathing uh, mask. You see the saturation there, 89, 90%. You've got the um, ABG there in kilopascal and, and millimeter of mercury. <laughs> I, I yeah. just <laughs> I'm mindful of the uh, audience here in the opinionator. Um, so the question is, first of all, uh, if you give you some seconds to have a look, what would you do next? The options are one, two, three, and Simon, I don't know how you can... Uh, make him magically appear? This is just a warm-up question, yeah? Is, uh, there will be more coming up. Can you go Sorry, you want to go backwards. So it's a little bit hypoxemic, quite a bit hypoxemic, in fact. Yes, we're quite hypoxemic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is low. Yeah. Uh, Maybe by Scottish terms, he's not drinking enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it's I, unreali unrealistic. I, qui I quite agree, yes. Um, okay. okay, so... But the patient is alert, I mean... Uh, he, he just, he's, he's just off, but he's, he's okay. You he's okay, but he's a bit dysnic, you know, he's 38 per minute, but he's also quite hypoxic. So how much of that is hypoxemia, how much of that is effort? What shall we do first? He's in A&E. Mm -hmm. um, these are the questions. Ah, we don't know. It's now. It's now. It's today. It's today. So, uh, Simon, how do we get to yeah. the... Yeah. Ah. Uh, so at the top of the screen, there is a website. If you go there, and there should be a joining code, and your answers will appear live on the screen. Not names. Not with names. <laughs> Not with names. Yeah. <laughs> or bank accounts, by any yeah. chance. <laughs> Exactly, so that would be just a little one. Option one. What was wow. option one? <laughs> option two. Okay, just to remind... Oh, okay, sorry. The, let's see, let it stabilize. I like it. It's a bit like the stock market. But clearly, few people still undecided. It's breathtaking. It's breathtaking, yes. I think we'll get, I'm sure we'll get quicker as we go along. Otherwise, this patient will never survive the intensive care. <laughs> <laughs> well, well as you, you, you all know me, and usually my cases, they all end up on ECMO. It won't be today. <laughs> today is going, well, if we do well, it'll do well, yeah. Okay, I think we're almost there, aren't we? Okay, so that's quite interesting. Just to remind ourselves, the um, 
The first option was high-flow nasal cannulae, followed by non-invasive ventilation, followed by intubation. And so you can see that the majority uh, went for between option and one, option two. Um, anyone who said option three, would anyone, you know, who would like to comment on option three? Come on, seven people have done that. <laughs> <laughs> so no point in... There's no right and wrong because the patient is going to go only one way. Yeah. <laughs> in most parts of the world, it would be yeah. debated because, uh, I mean, 38 uh, or uh, respiratory rate, uh, uh, pH is low. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not something crazy, no, to think to intubation. Okay. Mm. Did I, think, you? I think BMI of 40 um, plus everything else, I, I'm inclined to. I didn't vote for it, so I'll be the number eight. So you'll be the option three? Yeah. Okay, do. that's fine. So I think, you know, you're an A&E. I don't know what Penny, what um, Nader, what, you obviously, option one and two will skip you all together yeah. and go straight to three, yeah. Yeah, well certainly, uh, I think as been pointed out before, uh, the path of least resistance is the uh, intubation. I mean, I think most places, at least in the US, uh, but we are sort of core of non flow this patient probably exceeds some of the capabilities that you're going to get from high flow so you could make that argument I think the most important thing whatever you try you don't walk out of the room you're going to make sure that you if, I mean you could say well let's try the simplest thing and march through this but that would require you to be making sure you understand the patient responded the way you want I, you know the only other comment I would just make very quickly is I think that it's important to recognize, even though we use these terms kind of loosely, there's a difference between hypoxemia and hypoxia. Mm. And hypoxemia is actually tolerated uh, both acutely and chronically. And uh, I, I want to make sure that we don't just react to SAT monitoring, because sometimes uh, we see a SAT that's low and we just automatically assume this is a catastrophe. And I think there are ways, not to go into great detail here, but there are ways to sort that out at the bed, so bedside to just ask yourself if you have a little more time. Because sometimes these decisions require a little more time to sort it through. Like, like could someone just give him uh, like fentanyl? I, I don't know, mm -hmm. I mean, why, is, why does he have respiratory failure? Is it something that's a sort of hypoxemic, uh, hypercarbic respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure? Is it something that's acutely reversible? Because if it's something that is easily reversible, you have a, you're just buying a little time and perhaps you could make the argument of struggling a little bit with non-invasive, or giving that a try. Mm. I think it's a very point, and also, you know, intubating a patient like this, already very apoxemic, already with a respiratory rate of 38, might be quite challenging, BMI of 40 in A&E, so you might want to temporize something. Yeah. So, so I, although my heart At is At least improve a little oxygenation. A little bit, just give a little oh. bit of FRC maybe, ob ob obesity, as Isik said earlier on, might do well. So anyway, this patient, strangely enough, ah, uh, he'll come, he's next, he's next. <laughs> but we are real life NHS, just arrived, we don't know. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, strangely enough, for St. Thomas's, we started on non-invasive ventilation. Oh, sorry, where, how do I switch to? Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. And you can see, it was on face mask, no helmet. Uh, it was on pressure support of 12, uh, respi sorry, a peep of 10. His respiratory rate came down a little bit, and also his heart rate came down a little bit, uh, but still was an FIU2 of 0.8 to 1, and he does not like non-invasive ventilation. He says he cannot breathe with a non-invasive ventilation. Uh, one of the things I just put in there because we've not discussed, uh, how many people thought um, this patient was going to succeed uh, on non-invasive ventilation? Or did you use number two just to buy time? By time, no one really thought it was going to succeed by design, because otherwise we'll stop here, we'll go for lunch, <laughs> and then we'll be fine. It's not, <laughs> not ideal. But how many people would try awake prone positioning in this patient, even if we don't know the etiology? But it's 31st of uh, October 2022. Um, 
How many people will try? From procedures, by uh, awake, from 40, procedures. 40 or BMI yeah. could be challenging. Self-proning. Self-proning, yeah. OK. So, oh, yeah, this could be an idea, but. Could be an idea. Well, if, if it doesn't kill them, it can help them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a test. It's a test. Uh, the thing is, I want to show you this um, meta-analysis. Sorry, sorry but apologies. But in real life, you need uh, some, to, do, to do some diagnostic things. I don't know, yeah. chest is raised. I'll, okay. I'll show okay. you next. I'll show you next. The problem with power, <laughs> the problem with PowerPoints, it can't show everything at once. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll need we'll need to be a little bit patient. No, but I things mean, will come. It might be that patient, from patient, it will be difficult to perform. Uh, sure, sure, uh, sure. We'll absolutely. The slide, the patient is still stable, right. so we can all just relax a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Go. We're just going to say, and obviously uh, the other thing to point out is that I've arranged we've arranged the slides in a different in a direction. Obviously, one after the other. So if you think that something else should be changed, and not because we are wrong or you're wrong, it's just because we had to arrange in, in a certain way. So it's good to have a discussion. But just I want to show you this one, which is quite interesting. When you look at the awake prone positioning, and that's a meta-analysis, you can see that obviously it's a bit like what Louise was saying earlier on about non-invasive ventilation, et cetera. It, has got, uh, it seems to have a good effect in terms of intubation particularly when a patient is either on high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation, but in ICU. Mm. So in a way, this, this is very important because uh, there will be no effect on mortality, as you will all know. There will be an effect on, uh, on intubation, but obviously if the patient is already in the intensive care. So there is something important there. So this patient, this uh, patient, this paper is all COVID, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But in a way, if, even if it, the, the old paper before COVID-19, when awake proning wasn't so uh, fashionable, they did show a, an improvement in PF ratio. Uh, and maybe, you know, so if you've got some dorsal atelect, it would be very different as you, as you say, Tim, but this is specifically in COVID-19. Um, but we didn't, tr we didn't do a wake prone positioning because it was complicated and he didn't like, it was a bit restless. So what happens next? It gets a nice tube. Uh, <laughs> and I think the eight people on the right plus nine, as me, um, uh, agree. What do you think of the chest X-ray now? So now we've intubated this patient, obviously got um, uh, a sedation, so his blood pressure has changed. And that's his uh, ventilation. We do a rapid test and it's COVID positive, but just to be um, in, th you know, uh, uh, winter 2022 would be flu A <laughs> positive as well. So it's a double, double pathology. And I think, I suspect, unfortunately, we'll see quite a few of those uh, patients. So what do you think of this ventilation? And I've got, um, so if you think, if you look at the settings there, uh, the questions are the following. So the question is, do you think the tidal volume, uh, uh, let's look at the setting. So now we've got some stability. We've got the patient is comfortable, is uh, sedated and paralyzed. Uh, yeah, well, the question is, what are the settings and what can we do? So these are the anesthetist, intubator, the patient, oxylog, you can imagine. Those are the ventilator settings. But now we are in intensive care. We need to do some a little bit of uh, uh, optimization. Would you, the question is, would you be happy with, a, with those tidal volumes? Can you go next, please? Yeah, I certainly yes. can. So, and so we are on uh, plateau pressure 28, uh, uh, well. peak of 10. Salvatore is already not happy about it. <laughs> uh, I can see him itching. Uh, tidal volume of 450, that gives him a 6.3 milliliters per kilogram of predicted body weight and a respiratory rate of 25. Mm. FIO 2.8. So the questions are, are you happy with the tidal volume? First of all, who is not happy with the tidal volume? Couple of people not happy. Three people. Who is happy with the tidal volume? 
who doesn't care about the title <laughs> bar? <laughs> because there are a few of those. You don't know what that means. Okay, let's find out what it means. For <laughs> and so let's uh, think about that. And then I'll, I'll ask all the three questions in advance. And then because we will work through some assessment, some of it is common sense or the bedside. Some of it is a little bit more advanced, uh, but we can work it out. And the other question is, is PEEP appropriate for this patient? And what, whatever it means. Um, if, if you go by the ARDSNET PEEP at high every lab, it's probably lower than what you'd lower expect. Lower. So if you say, OK, let's start with a low PEEP at 502 table, it would be low even. Even then. Even though the most of the international guidance, regardless what the, no guidance, sorry, uh, observational studies seems to be PEEP 10 for everybody. So, <laughs> but I agree with you. That doesn't seem to be particularly, uh, uh, seems to be particularly low. Anybody else thinks they should be higher? Anybody? Well, uh, it depends. Okay, it depends. It it's, depends. Always, it's always great, you know. No, no, it depends because I, I don't want to anticipate, but in, at, at present, I'm not happy because the driving pressure is 18. Okay, so, so maybe let's see what it means. People in a would, uh, in, would improve something uh, or okay. uh, and then, and then uh, make it worse. worse. I, I don't know, but uh, at, at present, I'm not happy because. And another quest for problem is the I. Uh, I mean, the hemodynamic status don't seem okay. No, 124th over of uh, of uh, air trait, uh, blood pressure. Uh, so I don't know if it is septic patient. Or I we don't know about the causes. Well, it's got flu. But a, I'm flu a, a little COVID. afraid of right yeah. ventricle. I mean, okay. I don't. I'm, so I'm you not would sure. want an echocardiogram or no, so I mean, more investigation. No, I mean the ventilation uh, and, and so. On. Later. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I like that sort of. Uh, path that Salvatore is talking about, because I do think that, uh, if we go back to the x-ray for just a second, I, I think it's important to remember the fact that uh, chest x-rays and the other form of radiography that we call CAT scan, which is still an x-ray, but gives you much better spatial resolution, they are susceptible to over-interpretation, because we have, uh, we, don't, we have sensitivity, but not specificity. So what's all that white? What is that stuff? We know that it's not as aerated as a normal lung. Uh, if you look at the pattern, you can't see the diaphragms, you can't see the right heart, you can't see the left heart very well. Uh, the diaphragms are probably somewhere up there, uh, but generally speaking, infiltrative lung disease actually make the lung bigger, not smaller. So when we have volume loss, or the suggestion of volume loss, it is possible there's allotatic disease. And in, in essence, with PEEP, we're gonna fix, we're not gonna cure consolidated lung with PEEP. So you may get a hint, uh, rather than just assuming, let's say, COVID is in the right lung and, and flu is in the <laughs> left lung. I thought it was the other way around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And of course, interstitial edema, and of course the dreaded um, x-ray pattern of, what was it called? Yeah. Like COVID is ground glass appearance was, you know, ground glass is something that's been around much longer than COVID. And the radiographic patterns, give you some help, but they're not diagnostic, I guess is what I'm saying, that ultimately will come down to, if if Dr. Grouser goes in there and increases the PEEP and he says, let's see what happens to the driving pressure, then maybe what you did was make more aeration rather than just add more pressure. And I think that would be an important uh, idea. So we'll, we'll talk about this later on during okay. the right. course. It seems a diffuse idea, no? It yes, so it's diffuse bilateral. <laughs> usually this, uh, are better recruiters than focus. But okay. Uh, That's again, great. It seems useful. Okay, we'll present some of the data. Can, can I just of put course. in for discussion, invoke yeah. my mentor? Yeah. Dr. Rubenfeld would say, ah, what's the point? So what? What's Who the cares? point of a chest x ray? Yeah. Who cares? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All sorts of things, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, you can ignore it completely, yeah. but I think there might be some <laughs> value in it, just to make sure. <laughs> and also, you know, these patients... To are check the tube. Yeah, to <laughs> check the tube. Yeah. The tube, by the way, is fine. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, obviously, BMI of 40, <laughs> just being intubated and paralyzed, obviously, as most people are already uh, pointing out. So the question is... 
Just are you happy with the title volume? Still, I, I don't think so. Some people are not happy with the title volume. Some people are not happy with PEEP. And the question is, what mechanical variables you would concentrate first because are prognostically helpful? If you, if we don't, if you don't know that question, we'll we'll talk a little bit more. But I'll tell you, uh, Lorenzo has said, why don't you show this Excel that I've created uh, just uh, also with Francesco in in uh, previous years to see how we can make a little assessment of this patient. So you can see I put the date uh, there. It's uh, 31st of uh, October. Um, uh, and so basically, this is a 51-year-old. You can see there we've got a height of 175 and weight of 123 kilo. Sorry, should be male, not female. I don't know what. Yeah, well, that's right. It happens with the ideas. It happens. <laughs> that's why you look at the chest X-ray. Um, <laughs> And that's got. Uh, no, it's too much. And, a, and, pr and predicted body weight 67 kilo. So now, if you do some calculations, you'll find that this person FRC should be 2.5 liters, okay? Which would give. A, sorry, for some reason I don't have an indicator. Yeah, should give a compliance theoretical of 81 mils per kilo. Okay, we can go into this calculation when you feel particularly sleepy, uh, pre. So, okay, so we've, this is what we have so far. We've got the BMI of 40.1. Okay, so this is the um, ventilator. It's got a plateau pressure of 28. It's got a PEEP of 32 and a PEEP of 10, which gives a mean airway pressure of 18. It's got 450 tidal volume, respiratory rate of 25. And this is the inspiratory time of 0.9 with a total of 2.4 and 6.7 mils per kilo of ideal body weight. Those are the gases. I'm sorry, I all in kilopascal, but <laughs> essentially the same that you've seen. <laughs> now, if we want to look at the, how protective this lung is, Salvatore mentioned about driving pressure, which essentially is the plateau minus the peep, and is 18, okay? And if we think about the tidal volume, which is 450, uh, okay, we'll give you a driving pressure of 18. What do you think of that tidal volume based on the, this driving pressure? Do you think it's too low, too high, just about okay? Are you worried? Um, or you just stand there and no, wait? Okay. Okay. So you want to, to decrease a little the tidal volume? Well, I did. I'm just, I was experimenting. If you lower the tidal volume, yep. you might find the driving pressure improves to get more healthy. As long as the pH doesn't go too low. Okay. So basically, you're saying, okay, let's try and reduce the tidal volume to make it protective to go to a driving yeah, pressure um, less than 15 point. something. And then, and then let's see what else we can adjust to compensate for that drop in tidal volume. But essentially what you're saying is that for the compliance of that lung, which by the way is 25, you've got a, a lung that is quite small because when we make some calculations based on compliance, then the FRC, there should be 2.5 liters. The FRC actual of this patient is 780 milliliters. So you can see now how the lung has got smaller. And now this 450 milliliters, they need to go in 780 milliliters of, uh, of lung volume, which give us a dynamic strain of 0.56, yeah? So 60% of the, so this lung is stretched about 60% with that tidal volume. Associated with this driving pressure, we think that probably is too high, the tidal volume, okay? So that's one good thing. Then what else are we going to say? Look, the SVO2 is very low, obviously very low, 60%, and which is different from sepsis. This is a patient who's working really hard and cardiovascular is not sufficient. That gives us a shunt fraction of 39%. 
which is well above the 30% of shunt fraction, indicating he has got refractory hypoxemia. So what else are we going to do with this patient? Oh, this is just for fun. We calculated various things. We calculate a ventilatory ratio that is almost three. I don't know whether you're familiar with the ventilatory ratio, but it's an index of um, dead space dead ventilation. Space and it's got a calculated dead space of 31%. So everything is really high, uh, indicating it's a very severe uh, uh, lung disease. So the question is, so far, what we've got is that we decrease the tidal volume and we measure the driving pressure. Is there anything, is this the real driving pressure? Hmm. This in is an the obese question. patient. In an obese patient. How can we check at the bedside? At the bedside? With a ventilator. Anyone? Okay, so you can do it intrinsic PEEP, and actually intrinsic PEEP is not really elevated. So, but how else can we check at the bedside? Okay, could we do esophageal balloon monitoring, uh, but at the moment we, we need to go and find it. <laughs> is there anything else? Yeah, is there anything else that we can do at the bedside without esophageal? Yeah, go for it. Compliance divided by tidal volume. We could do that, but still we don't have the idea of what the real compliance is. Uh, and I'm just going to show you an idea. We could do a low flow maneuver, couldn't we? Uh, because look at this, what happens here. You go from, yeah, you go from zero, slow, uh, eight liters per minute, really slow, up, 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 and up to a 35 of 910. And you can see here, then nothing happens until PEEP, or the airway pressure, is about 15, okay? Airway opening pressure. So, exactly, so now what you can see is that the airway opening pressure is 15, which is above 10, yeah? So he's got a PEEP of 10, so five centimeters of water are wasted in moving the chest wall. So actually, the driving pressure is not 28 <coughs> minus 10, but it's 28 minus 15. So would that change your mind about tidal volumes now? So now it is 13. So now it's 13. What do you think? Would you change the tidal volumes? Would you change the PEEP? What would you do with the PEEP? Maybe. Maybe. Okay, I'd we've like got to maybe. Try, I mean, okay, so I mean, what would it's you? It's a dynamic process. No, yeah. you try, you see what happens. No. Yeah. Oh. So w what would you try? Because the the key thing sometimes we'll need to do something on the bedside. No, I, I would or? like. I mean, in real life, I would like to stabilize more hemodynamics. Okay, so we've stabilized the hemodynamic. You are satisfied maybe with the hemodynamic. Maybe pico or something. Put a pico like in, uh, and then uh, increase P. Okay, so do you agree that minimum we need 15? For sure. For sure, because essentially what's happening with this, um, we'll see later on, this um, uh, BMI of 40, Penny, you've got a beautiful slide, I remember an elephant sitting on the yeah. chest and trying to lift the elephant before the lungs can actually inflate. <laughs> and you can see that this patient has got a pleural pressure that causes airway closure and the airway closure doesn't resolve until the airway pressure at least matches the pleural pressure and starts essentially lifting the lung in a very simplistic way. And then you start the inflation. So actually, up to 15, you've got, you've got nothing. So now you've got 28 minus 15, so you can safely change your pressure. And this is a very simple maneuver that can be done at the bedside, I think with most ventilators. Luigi, can I just make a of course, point, yes. I think you're illustrating, but I think it's an important one only because uh, I, I think sometimes when I'm rounding, people have this idea that the snapshot you took is the patient you're stuck with. In other words, there are interventions that you have to understand whether they would make an effect or not and whether you can actually help this patient or not. In fact, I would say that if you drop tidal volume in a patient like this, you could actually worsen things. Absolutely. Even though on the ventilator, you know, you're looking at uh, perhaps numbers that look better to you 
uh, in, a, in a similar analogy to pressure, you know, we look at pressure as what is pressure? What's pressure? For, uh, pressure relates a force to area. And so what we don't understand by just looking at that number is what we've done to the area. So theoretically, if you just drop the pressure and you find comfort in that, it may not actually be doing something useful to the lung or protecting the lung. You may be actually lowering the area to such a degree that you're actually increasing the force that affects it. So the ventilator isn't sort of the, by itself, isn't sort of the yeah. patient you're stuck with, basically. <coughs> and it's, it's a very, very good point because over time, so let's say we didn't do that and we dropped the tidal volumes, the lungs would get smaller and smaller and smaller. Over time, the driving pressure might be getting bigger and bigger and bigger and becomes a point where we can't ventilate a patient like that. Whereas if we do this maneuver, which is very simple, it takes very few seconds. Actually, it'll tell you here how long it takes, 11 seconds. In 11 <laughs> seconds, you have an answer. Uh, you have an answer about the PEEP, and then you know about your driving pressure. You can measure compliance, you can measure everything. And you can see we had increased already the PEEP to 14, with a PEEP of uh, sort of peak inspiratory pressure 28, but obviously it looks like we might need to do a little bit more. Any questions about that? So, yeah, sorry, I didn't see you there. I mean, could you potentially do both? You know, if you have the concept of the baby lung yep. um, and you need it in the higher peak to maintain the air there to initiate <coughs> ventilation, but then if you find a higher tidal volume on top of that, you can just prohibit the potential. Absolutely, yes. Uh, and it's an iterative plan. You know, you start assessing, you start realizing what sort of lung and chest wall I'm ventilating, and then you start moving something that is obviously wrong, in this particular case is the PEEP, and then you start again, and you think, you know, what's everything else is from now on. But obviously, this is just an idea. So you can see this initial part is all tubing. This is the compliance of the tube. It's nothing to do with the, with the lungs. Then you've got a compliance of the respiratory system there, and so if you didn't, if you, if you take into account the opening pressure, you've got a compliance of 32. If you don't take into consideration the airway opening pressure, you've got a compliance of 18. So it'll give you, a, and obviously that will reflect also the, um, the, the, the concept of driving pressure. Uh, now, this is just an example, but essentially I've showed you already. If you don't have a low flow maneuver, you can do it very simply with any ventilator by put in, putting the patient on volume control uh, and give a very slow flow. So the flow will be eight instead of your normal 50 or 60, and you give maybe five breaths. And what you can see, essentially you can see this rise in, uh, in pressure before you've got change in volume. And if you stop the cursor and measure it there, then you have an idea of opening pressure. So you don't need to do a low flow maneuver if your ventilator doesn't, doesn't give you the opportunity. But you can do it with any ventilator. Uh, this is a little video that basically shows you how to do it when you can't. And essentially, uh, just any, any ventilator go down on the rate, uh, five or six, uh, your tidal volume, whatever that might be, and you have an inspiratory time that is high, so the flow uh, drops to whatever you want, five or six or eight, and then you um, obviously go peak to z zero if you are courageous, so you can go to five if the patient, you don't, it, it makes no difference. And if you start, and then you get this uh, lovely uh, maneuver. You can see sats of 89 are so great uh, and uh, better than before. And then you see here, you've got an opening pressure there. And you know that it's an opening pressure because there is no flow before that pressure. Anyway, any questions so far? <laughs> any <laughs> observations so far? Does it make sense? So the first two, three assessment. But now I'm going to ask you another couple of questions. Um, so what, are, what is the effect of uh, 
you know, what about the BMI of 40? We've talked about the BMI of 40. And based on that, do you think a plateau of 28, is it too high? Is it just okay? Or is it too low? Sorry? Okay, so it would be lovely to have an esophageal pressure monitoring, but can I ask how many people have an esophage would put an esophageal pressure monitoring? So you're great. Anyone else? Maybe timidly. <laughs> so what, are, what other people are going to do? So we put an esophageal pressure, and it's great, but what about if we don't have one or if we can't do it? So the idea is that um, it's very difficult. So this is, an, a, is a nice paper <coughs> looking at esophageal pressure in uh, morbid obesity. There are um, patients up to 70, 80 of BMI in this uh, particular um, paper. But what you can see is you don't know. Because based on the on weight, you can't really say whether you need high, low, high PEEP or low PEEP. But if you look at these patients, this patient is a low flow maneuver. And some patients are straight. There is no airway opening pressure. So they might not need 18 of PEEP, 20 of PEEP. And actually, if we do that, it might be very damaging. Whereas other patients, look, unless they've got 20, 22, 25 of, of, of PEEP, they will not be able to overcome their chest wall elastance. So this is just one way to say, do it. it. It takes very little time, and it can give you so, so much information about that particular patient. And in the case of super, uh, or, or obesity, where the patients are in this category or in this category. Um, any comments? Penny, Nader? Um, just, just very quickly, the, do they give you some idea on this? I don't know this paper, so is the BM, where's, where do you wear the BMI? Exactly. Is it here or is it there? Because there could be a difference. Uh, could be a difference. A very high BMI that isn't, uh, doesn't have as much cardiopulmonary mm. uh, impact. Yeah. But this is, I mean, I don't know whether um, Manu, uh, whether he had any comments on, mm. on this particular one. So you are or saying that the, the uh, airway opening pressure is high, you can tolerate higher deep blast? Yeah. But you don't know. You don't know. But no, I, I mean, you can quantify, because in the trial, uh, it says when, when a patient is obese, uh, morbidly obese, and this BMI higher than 30, then you can tolerate up to 35. You remember the express trial, for example, no? Where they set up PEEP uh, to reach a certain plateau pressure. They say when the patient wa is obese, then you can tolerate not 28, but 32, or 34, 35 is the top. But I don't know if it is possible to, without esophageal pressure, to quantify. Uh, so this is very good point, but this is a study that compares this maneuver mm -hmm. with an esophageal pressure. Okay. And what they say is essentially, if you do a low flow maneuver, you imagine this, that you add pressure to the system, and until the chest wall is lifted, or the airway pressure is equal to the pleural pressure, you have no flow. Okay. And then after you have flow, that means that now your airways are open and you overcome the, the pleural pressure. And they've demonstrated quite nicely in this group of patients who were anesthetized super obesity. So, so you're so suggesting to, to dig to have a plateau pressure minus our opening pressure that's your driving pressure. But oh. also I'm suggesting that once you have an appropriate PEEP, it might well be that you need less of a driving pressure and your plateau pressure doesn't change. But we don't know for sure. Until we measure, we don't know. So I suggest uh, you do this simple maneuver. You get so much information. And the other thing is um, to say that is that this really fits with your end expiratory um, um, esophageal pressure. So you could do the same. Um, I'll skip this boring one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, why, why, what are we sort of interested in? Is it tidal volume, driving pressure? I don't know. What do you target in your, in your clinical practice? Do you go for tidal volume? 
Do you go for driving pressure? Do you go for tidal volume predicted body weight first? And then you look at the driving pressure. I think it's quite useful. So if you look at this study, for example, look, this is the elastance. You know, imagine this high elastance means low compliance. You can see when your compliance is high or the elastance is low, it doesn't really matter what you give because the driving pressure actually is this six mils per kilo, 12 mils per kilo, even at that extreme that no one does anymore, uh, the, the difference in driving pressure is very small. But as you increase the elastance, so as the compliance gets smaller and this patient lung volume goes down, then e every milliliter really matters because look at the difference in driving pressure is enormous. Then when your elastance is high, you know, you've got a driving pressure that difference that is quite significant. So I normally, I don't know you, but I start with a six to eight mils per kilo and then look at the driving pressure, correct what I'm doing, and then, and then adjust based on that. Maida, you had a observation. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, I struggle with the idea that uh, aside from normal people where lung volume correlates reasonably well with height, I don't know how disease expression mm. is limited by your body weight. So I've never really, I've always struggled with that idea. And I think just looking at the tidal volume on the ventilator, you may not be treating the patient, you're treating the ventilator. And at some point you have to decide whether we are dealing with uh, a lung that is, can tolerate the, what is the lung you're putting the volume into? I mean, just look at exercise physiology. Uh, strenuous exercise, the tidal volumes are 40 ml, 50 ml per kg. That would be a disaster of people exploding, you know, runners exploding on every <laughs> street corner. And uh, sometimes they the do. The sometimes lung. they do. So, so obviously the normal lung can, can handle volume. I'm not, I'm not suggesting 40, 50 mLs per kg. I'm just trying to put the perspective in that you need to know what you're putting it into. And of course this is why end expiratory lung volume is important, or FRC, the one you, it's really, you know, if the, if the FRC is small and the tidal volume is big, that's technically dynamic strain, even if it's six mLs per kg. Yes. So sometimes you need less, and sometimes more is not a big deal at all in the lung, which I think you're showing quite nicely. So again, it's sort of not sort of being stuck on that number solely. The, the brain shouldn't arrest right at that number. It should continue to have a few thoughts, I think. Absolutely. But now you made a good point earlier on. So now we've got a situation where if you optimize everything, so let's say, uh, P, and you reduce the, tri the, the tidal volume, you adapt the tidal volume, we might have a problem with mean of ventilation. And mean of ventilation, obviously, or dead space, means hypercapnia. So the question is, how do we decide, how would you decide between having a higher tidal volume and a, <laughs> and a lower rate, or a higher rate and a lower tidal volume? So did I say it correctly? Yeah. High or low, low and high. What, what do you do at the bedside for the same mean of ventilation? Do you have a rule? Do you have something? Yeah, go. Okay. It's a little trial and error. And obviously, as you say, the more you increase respiratory rate, the more your dead space to yes. mean of ventilation. And there are also some data, experimental, no? I, we perform some studies in an eclectic topic that is the, the effect of respiratory rate on ventilator-induced lung injury. However, uh, you have to consider this because uh, the number of time you uh, deliver the, 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 the driving pressure, the, the tidal volume, and you generate the driving pressure is one of the components. And we made this study several years ago with the uh, CO2 removal in order to test the two respiratory rate uh, and the, the pigs uh, that were ventilated with lower, with lower respiratory rate, they uh, the less cytokines uh, 
in the lung and circulating. And, but this is experimental. In the, the clinical rule, I agree with the, the colleague, uh, no more than 30 is, uh, then I, I am afraid of intrinsic PEEP. The flow is very high. Um, this generates some uh, increase in uh, mechanical power too. Uh, so, uh, Okay, well, okay. Sounds, sounds reasonable. Um, now, th after lunch, when you'll be full of glucose and probably <laughs> half asleep, um, we'll talk a little bit more how we can find a little trade-off between tidal volume and respiratory rate. But I don't want to spend a lot of time now because uh, we've, got, we've got loads to do with this patient still. So we'll talk about how to choose between more tidal volume or more rate or the other way around. The question is, we've got next steps, and that's where <laughs> we'll find it. So the question is, what have we done? We've done PEEP. We've, um, we think we've optimized tidal volume based on the driving pressure. Um, we have, um, we have, what else have we done? We've stabilized the hemodynamics, we've done an echocardiogram. Uh, the question is, what are we going to do next? Um, the next step, or the best next step, what should it be? We had a driving pressure of still 13, 14, if we consider the opening pressure. So the question is, are we paralyzing this patient? BMI of 40? Uh, ops, a problem with opening pressure. Are we recruiting? We increase even more PEEP? Shall we change the tidal volume in higher or lower? Or shall we try and prone this patient? Um, what would you do next? Have we got, have we got a little, uh, we've got five choices. We've got five choices, yes. I think uh, we, we haven't, but we will. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I just I thought we'd stop at four, but actually we exceeded our expectations. <laughs> so just, just an idea. Have a little think on Mentimeter, and uh, we'll get there in a second. So this is the next step, because obviously all of them might be right, in, but the question is, what would you do immediately next? Uh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit dead. Should we do show hands? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So who would do one? Sorry, I, I won't look. I won't look. <laughs> one, one, one as a next step. Okay, four or five. Okay. What about recruitment maneuver? Would you recruit this patient? Even lots of pressure and lots of peep. You uh, voted twice. <laughs> <laughs> so. So can I check how many people would not do a recruit maneuver, just to be safe in my head? I would not do it. Those you would not. Who would people would not do it? <laughs> okay. And some other people will call a friend. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, and obviously, what about prone position? How many people would prone right now? Right now. Okay, so you're prone right now. It's 40, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, it's BMI of 40, <laughs> few nurses on their brains. You didn't give me that information. Um, <laughs> so I think what happened next, this gentleman had a neuromuscular blockade. <laughs> Horror. Okay, so he had neuromuscular blockade. Sorry. Do you want to stay up there for dinner? No, I think we'll, um, we've moved on. And neuromuscular blockade, and actually, the FiO2 start coming down a little bit, uh, but still we haven't changed anything there, mainly. Uh, and in the last four hours, yeah, this is what the, the thing percent. was. So obviously we talked about PEEP a little bit, and I'm just going to just say very briefly about uh, PEEP. And one of the questions are, how do we know whether a patient might benefit from high recruitment or not, uh -huh. from a recruitment? Because the question, some of you said, yes, I would recruit. Some other people said, no, I wouldn't. And some people were in the middle, and I noticed. Uh, probably <laughs> you were thinking, how do I know if this patient will benefit from recruitment? So what would you do next if you were unclear whether or not to perform a recruitment maneuver? Because I think we all agree, and I'll show you later on this evening, that uh, recruiting everyone like that without any personalization is not the right thing to do. Oh, he should respond, uh, she should respond to, I mean, 
in general. He's a male. He's a male. Yeah. He's a male yes. <laughs> I don't remember. Well, he had a transition mind. period. He, was, he, he had a moment <laughs> on the Excel spreadsheet, but it's okay. So, I mean, looking at the chest X-rays is not enough, no? But mm -hmm. usually they are more recruiter than the patient okay. with focal RDS. So this might be an indication. He's an early RDS, so might be. He's an obese patient, so yeah. this no, is it's important. Very good point. So there are several reasons to think that, uh, not in general, because the art trial, we know, we all know the art trial, we all know, <laughs> but in this case, uh, yeah. might be reasonable to try to recruit. Sounds good. The question is, you say, a population level, probably someone with a chest x-ray that is bilateral, is obese, might recruit more than, but how do we know specifically in this particular patient in front of us, what manoeuvres can we do? What would you do? What do you mean? What kind of man or recruiting maneuver? Oh, what kind of test would you do? I'll, t I'll tell you. Shall we, <laughs> uh, shall we go that way? <laughs> so one of the things we can do is lovely low flow maneuvers, again, uh, where you can see uh, essentially the hysteresis of the lung. You can do an in inspiratory limb and expiratory okay. limb. And sometimes you can look at the difference between the inspiration and expiration, and that will give you an idea of lung hysteresis. Now, these are some patients that we've collected together, actually, Francesco, you collected some of these. Look at this interesting. This is a patient uh, also obese. You can see nothing, nothing, and then it starts working out. Now, you notice that we've only stopped at 30, 28, 30 centimeters of water. So this is just the pressure within a normal tidal breath. We're not doing a recruit maneuvers as such, but we are going to find out, okay, first of all, is there an opening pressure? That will be interesting. And then look at the difference between this pattern and this pattern. Mm -hmm. So you've got an interesting point, you've got the di if you stop at 20 centimeters of water, you measure the volume there and the volume there, you can see the difference between inspiratory and expiratory limb, actually I should say the other way around, was about 70 milliliters. Whereas this patient here was 450 milliliters. So the literature says above 200 milliliters, you have got higher uh, probability of, recruit of recruitability. Now, look how, in what this is quite interesting, I found. So this patient had such a high opening pressure that when the volume went down, it had airway collapse and instability. Anyway, so this patient here, uh, you can see opening pressure about 14, same as, uh, almost same as this patient, but one was highly potentially recruitable the other one, very low, potentially recruitable. I've not given an injurious ventilation because it's the same plateau pressure they're getting 25 times a, 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 a month, I was going to say, a minute anyway. <laughs> but this has got only very little, and this has got much more. And this is quite interesting because once you do a little bit, you start seeing some, unless you adjust the peep, you do a low, a low flow maneuver, half an hour later, and the compliance deteriorates, indicating that your PEEP uh, level wasn't sufficient not, not and you get some uh, alveolar instability and collapse again. Does it make sense? I think that this is an interesting thing about low flow maneuver and PLR is potential for lung recruitment. I love maneuvers, I can't agree with that. So okay, that's great, I like. I agree with you. This is only a test, but the question is, would you do this in this patient, what you just said, or would you do it in this patient? I wouldn't, I wouldn't attempt in this patient, but I would, I would like, so this is only a test to do exactly what you're saying. Thank you. 
But at a practical level, let me, let me feed back to you and say that the patient that we said at the beginning, you know, had we not done all this, we, we thought he had a very high driving pressure, had probably excessive tidal volume for the lung weight. Whereas once we've done that, we realized that it wasn't part of it, it was a mechanical issue. So I agree that parameters may stay the same, but actually we need to understand whether they apply those parameters to that patient in trying to understand a little bit the physiology. Otherwise, we'll do six mils per kilo, 28 plateau, driving pressure 14, and we don't need to be there. Uh, we just, anyone can be there. But we can do the same thing, sort of uh, driving pressure 14, et cetera, but understanding whether it's, you know, what actually we're doing. And I'm not, I am agreeing with you, but I'm, I'm just thinking that testing is, is good. And as I said, it takes 11 seconds to do this maneuver. Literally, because eight, eight liters per minute. Yeah, and actually, I, I agree with, with you, you Luigi. Know. I also agree with you, Tim. I think it's really important. And I think what this illustrates is that it, there's more to opening the lung than just one maneuver. And uh, your point about time is important, Tim. What makes a recruitment maneuver not durable? Why? I mean, if you look at the anesthesia literature where they use something called the vital capacity, which is a recruitment maneuver, call it vital capacity, I guess, to get away from the name recruitment maneuver, maybe. Uh, but those lungs are still healthy. They still surfactant. And the lung just geometrically is an unstable, it's a compromise between surface area and fitting into our thoracic cavity. So it needs stabilizers. And those stabilizers have been assaulted in typical <coughs> patients. You know, it's alveolar interdependence. Surfactant is huge at low lung volume. That's better at higher lung volume. Then you have nitrogen. <coughs> You know, so there's a lot of things that aren't going to be cured with one maneuver, and drifting back to where you were before seems like not a not a durable idea. So I, that's kind of why I'm sort of opposed to the idea of recruitment maneuver, just because I just don't know how to sustain it well. It's a good point, and in fact, I was just going to show you this one. <clears throat> I'm sure. I'm sorry if there mm -hmm. is. Someone who doesn't like red and green, but I will. Uh, uh, I will just done it in honor of Salvatore. Looks like an Italian flag, so <laughs> I just I thought I'll do. It. But just let's start from a, this idea. You know, let's say when we add peep or recruit maneuver or mean airway pressure, whichever you want, we really don't know what we are doing because if you look at this one, for example, this idea is your, let's say, total lung capacity, okay? So if we go above total lung capacity, that's not great for the lung. If we go close to, lung, uh, close to total lung capacity, it's not great for the lung either. But total lung capacity is made up of, let's say, FRC, yeah? Uh, we've got, this is a mild disease, we've got some PEEP volume. So when we add vo uh, PEEP, we add a static volume. And if we multiply the PEEP by the compliance of the patient, we know exactly what PEEP volume means. And on top of that, which sort of this, the sum of the two is the end expiratory lung volume. If we add tidal volume on top of that, we've got the, the total volume in the lung, okay? So if you imagine, look at these proportions. We've got a lot more FRC in mild disease, small PEEP volume, because usually the PEEP is more. And, and the tidal volume. Now, when we go into severe disease, but low PEEP, then the PEEP volume might still be low. We've lost some FRC already, and the tidal volume is still the same because we're based on mils per kilo. Now, look at the difference between the two, non-recruitable and recruitable. Okay, non-recruitable means that we add PEEP. That PEEP will not increase the FRC, but it will just inflate the lung, okay? We'll inflate the lung, the PEEP volume goes up, maybe the tidal volume is reduced, but look, we are much higher total volume. We are closer to total lung capacity. 
Whereas what we want to understand is whether a patient with the same severity, we can modify the um, areated lung tissue and therefore the FRC, therefore the PEEP volume will be less because part of it opens uh, previously closed lung units. And then the tidal volume, the same tidal volume, will achieve a lower lung distending pressure. And in a way, what we want is to understand between these two things, because we don't want to give high PEEP and recruitment in these patients. At the same time, we can have some advantage in these patients. Would you uh, support that view? Uh, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, Tim? Yeah. OK. Ah, we can't, but we can estimate it um, <laughs> indirectly. So, but what we did, we did a recruitment maneuver because how can you not? Because, uh, uh, you know, if we don't do that, people get very upset. So, and we've done it according to your, the methodology that you were discussing earlier. So what we've done, we've done a peep up and a peep down, okay? Because we had, you know, Salvatore, you were talking about bilateral infiltrates, obesity, had a huge hysteresis, so probably higher potential for lung recruitment. Probably. Probably. Mm. So it's just enough to say, okay, we've got a patient on 80% oxygen, he's obese, he's got bilateral infiltrates, um, lung is small, let's do it. So what we've done, we've gone up on the plateau, we've gone up on the peep, maintain the same driving pressure. Most of us in this room do pressure control, yes? Yes. Okay. You can do the same volume control, just switch the axis around. Mm -hmm. And basically what we see, look at the tidal volume here, and you look at your end tidal CO2. The end tidal CO2 is a really powerful marker of lung perfusion. As we go up on the pressure, if we have a massive drop in entitled CO2, usually will be hemodynamically, will have a consequence hemodynamically, and then the saturation might not reflect recruitment, but reflects perfusion. Anyway, we'll do this our way up, we keep our eyes closed, and then we'll go all the way back down. You see the same peep. And what we have here, we can see, first of all, the delta change in tidal volume, and the delta change in compliance. And you can see, actually, that as the PEEP goes up, the, the compliance doesn't change. In fact, it gets worse, a higher PEEP, and likes a PEEP between 10 and 12. <coughs> this is where this, the maximum uh, change in compliance is. And in fact, uh, um, look at the difference when we add uh, the important things that you were saying earlier on, Salvatore and other people were saying, is how do we choose between low PEEP and higher driving pressure, or higher PEEP, even if we can achieve a lower driving pressure? So we know that driving pressure is, r reflects the tidal volume on the FRC, but using PEEP to reduce the driving pressure is not a good idea, and I'll show you that. Look at this, 25 and 8, driving pressure 17. Look, dynamic strain is 0.54, so tidal volume divided by FRC. But when you look at the total strain, which is the dynamic strain plus the strain due to PEEP, so which is, can be calculated very simply by PEEP multiplied by 24, it'll give you a, a, strain, a total strain of 0.74. Now keep in mind these three numbers, and actually four numbers. You can do it. We can all do it. Now we are going to increase the peak to 20, okay? The plateau now is still 28. The driving pressure is reduced to eight. Great, isn't it? But look at the total strain. This is increased to 1.3. So this is a patient where Although the, the PEEP increase has decreased the driving pressure, and if you give 40 of PEEP, your driving pressure will be zero because you can't breathe, um, essentially ha, ha, has had the effect of increasing the total strain. And actually, I've not talked about mechanical power. Look, the mechanical power here was 22, and you give 20 of PEEP, the mechanical power has gone up, despite the fact the driving pressure has gone down. 
So one of the messages here in the last few minutes is to think about use the driving pressure for tidal volume, don't use the PEEP to reduce the driving pressure. Because although this will decrease, and if you give 50 of PEEP, I'll tell you you'll have minus one of driving pressure, mortality should be much better, but your strain and mechanical power will be much increased. Um, any other thoughts about this? Uh, close your eyes, I'll, go, I'll move forward, forward, forward. Any other questions so far? Any other observations more than questions? The driving pressure uh, research, is that done with open end brackets? And if not, then do we know what driving pressure we should put on it? I think it's a great question. So we don't know that. There's, this is all database, you know, gone back to the database, done some mediation analysis, um, meditation analysis, <laughs> like uh, Professor Gattinoni likes to call it. Um, and we don't know. So it might be that most patients had an opening pressure of zero, so that 15 actually reflects the true driving pressure. And other people may have had five or six in that case, but a population level, uh, that's what it is. But now, Salvador, in the last few minutes, I was going to go back to your point. Would you do the same in these two scenarios. So you've got the, our patient and this patient. Would you treat them in the same way? No. So um, uh, Manu said earlier not. on that actually, you know, if you've got two, two. Um, I would shed the tube with this. <laughs> so, so we'll put it, <laughs> it might be, yeah, apparently, yeah. <laughs> we'll push it down a bit more. <laughs> but would you say, Manu, you were saying that if you had two zone ARDS, or no, two quadrant on the same side, is the same as bilateral. So no, I think I'm saying not from a respiratory physiology point of view. No, no, I, I made understand. the point that in, mm. if you're looking for mortality and yep. excess risk from ARDS, yep. that looks the same. Okay. So the treat on, uh, I love your physiology, Louise. I totally love it. <laughs> but, but I love it. <laughs> but <laughs> just enough to make me feel good. And then <laughs> but but uh, uh, the rest of the things is for lunch time discussion. I just wonder whether how much of uh, that physiology we can truly translate into a treatment effect. That is a challenge, right? I think mm -hmm. here, here is probably an extreme example where yeah. totally physiology would be the best thing to follow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's quite interesting because I think Salvatore was talking about this study before, wasn't it? So this was a study that basically looked at the x-ray, mm -hmm. patient with ARDS, and say, is it unilateral or is it bilateral? And if you... If, if focal and non-focal. Focal and non-focal. So if it's focal, so like the patient I showed you earlier on, this one, we could so call it. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not like this. Huh? <laughs> I mean, this is monolateral. Yeah, or unilateral or focal, <laughs> let's say. So one lobe or one side. Then then they would get prone positioning, low peep, nothing else. And if they were bilateral, you know, diffuse bilateral, we get recruitment maneuver, high peep, et cetera. And that's what you were referring to earlier. Yes, I was referring to this. Uh, okay, so this is the per protocol analysis. So you randomize patients, you give them the treatment, and you see there is a difference, okay? Per protocol analysis. But loads of patients got the x-ray wrong. <laughs> so what was actually bilateral they thought was focal, and what was focal they thought was bilateral. So there was a huge confusion. But look at this thing. So if you get things wrong, uh, then this is non-focal. So this is when you get it right. So the survival increases. If you treat a patient with non-focal disease uh, with prone positioning and low PEEP, actually survival is lower, but not that much lower. But the main difference is in focal disease. So if you've got focal disease and you give a recruitment maneuver, high PEEP, then the survival is much lower than if you correct them, if you classify them correctly. Yeah, I just have a few thoughts on that. Mm. Sit well with me. Can we go back to the x ray for a second? Which one? The real yeah, one or the this, fake this one? Comparison yeah. I, I think that um, 
And maybe it's because uh, I'm old enough where we didn't have other anything but chest x-rays. But there's a lot of information you can extract from an x-ray. Uh, the, again, the, the focality or the density itself lacks specificity. We don't know what it is technically. I mean, that's a tumor. Uh, it's leukemia, lymphoma in the lung. You know, but you can tell that there's a drastic difference here. The right lung, the diaphragm's approaching being flat, and there's some inflation there. Mm -hmm. And the lung with the density, sorry, the, the left lung with the density in it is also inflated. It's not loss of volume. So density with loss of volume is different than, mm -hmm. you know, because think about what are we doing, really? What do we do with prone positioning? We're putting in maneuvers, PEEP. What are we really doing? We're not going to fix consolidated lung, whether it's a tumor that's infiltrated the parenchyma of the lung or pus from pneumonia or hemorrhage. What we can do is, of course, within that hemithorax, there's a bunch of other processes going on. I mean, just because you've got something like a tumor in your lung or uh, a pneumonia doesn't mean you don't have areas of the lung that are potentially collapsible, edematous, sure. that may respond. It's, it's the recruitability potential, I guess. Obviously, someone who just has healthy lungs, goes to the OR, has a very long procedure, by basilar collapse, those patients, you can cure their x-ray in almost a minute, you know. Uh, so I think that the, the x-ray, I have a problem with the x-rays in general, and sort of the false, in my opinion, the false construct of, of you know, the density or the, even the zones don't, I, I, you know, I struggle with it. I, think. I, I, I'm, I may be wrong, but, but I don't know any data that has really shown, other than the, the construct that we've created, you know, reasonably, to, to try to quantify or categorize people, you know, like how much of their disease has progressed. I mean, but is a, you know, there's a, there was an old term called marching pneumonia. Did you guys ever hear of marching pneumonia? I mean, when you have pneumonia on one side, <coughs> you get it on the other disease. Did it go from here to here, or did they just get septic, and this is the edematous lung, and that's the, the lung that's full of pus? You know, again, it does, it, there's a lot there that I don't think we can infer just by looking at an x-ray. I, just, I think uh, the, the only point I was going to make was if you, it depends on the uh, method you use to look at the radiology, right? If you go for a, a point you made earlier, which is if you go for a CT scan, this bilateral presence of airspace shadowing would, would probably precede what you when, you when you get in a chest x ray. So I think it may be that the method that you use to quantify should be standardized. And uh, Luigi, if you come back to the study from Jean-Michel Constant, okay. Um, the assumption is that focal is a non-recruiter, and uh, but if you substitute, perhaps we are able to substitute a recruiter and non-recruiter, maybe it would be perfect, no? Yeah, it could be. The only, and, and in a way, that's what but we However, if you use yeah. a strategy that is aggressive uh, in patients that are not recruiting, you get a disaster. I mean, <laughs> this is the... And, and in a way, that's the point, because if we don't measure yeah. some elements that might point us more towards recruitment or non-recruitment, we might not know. And actually, some of these patients might do w well with a peep of five or eight in prone position without attempting too much. So that's, I think that's the point I, of that, I, that a, a, a paper that published several years ago. We, we published in a blue journal, but in which we try to apply to patients with focal arts at a CT scan uh, the uh, PIT table, no? And that, that was a very big problem because uh, the PIP table, uh, increase, you in, having to increase PIP, uh, the lower PIP table, no? Because you have to increase PIP if you don't get oxygenation and you cannot increase FiO2. So in that kind of patient, we showed an uh, increasing stress index and uh, everything uh, get worse, uh, simply applying the, the rules, the, 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 the PIP table and the PIP, uh, PIP FIU2 table. So this is uh, something that we know. Uh, the problem is to identify patients that are recruiters, because as, as you showed with the clinical case, it was brilliant. Uh, that, that patient that seems, uh, seemed a patient very easy recruitable was a non-recruiter, actually. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. So they are, in a way, challenging the assumptions mm -hmm. and, and go from population-based medicine to some tests that you can do. So I'm not talking about really complex physiological, but just simple f maneuvers that you can do, sorry. On that note, is, have you got experience in you know, sort of other non-ventilator related ways to assess the contortion, like lung oxygen, fusion, yeah. volumetric tests? You can do them all. You can do anything. You can do clearly lung ultrasound. You can do, but the, the, the question is also, what kind of maneuver do you do to assess so that ultrasound, low flow curves are only tools. The question is, what kind of test do you do at the ventilator to give you that information? So what I hope we've been discussing, that you don't need to do a full recruitment to understand whether a patient might or may not benefit from recruit from recruitability from a recruitment maneuver or, or higher PEEP. And the other thing, the, the final point I want to make is that if you remember the PEEP volume argument we said earlier on, so if you've got here um, the l compliance is low and you give 10 of PEEP, let's say 20, and you give 10 of PEEP, you've got a lung volume increases by 200 milliliters, yeah? If this is normal lung and has got, let's say, a compliance of 50, and you give 10 of PEEP to this patient, you've got an inflation of 500 milliliters in this lung, and you've got zero in this lung. So then you can start having problem with perfusion, hemodynamics, et cetera, et cetera. And you're having flow on the other side. And, and then all the time might flow on, on the other side. But I just, I thought it might be good to go through a sim <coughs> relatively simple case uh, where we see all the time and we'll see more over the weekend, uh, no, over the weekend, <laughs> over the next winter. And actually saying that there are a few things that we can do to personalize. Uh, I hope you find some interest, but Thank you all for participating in lunch class. <laughs>